difficult, 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 and if we sound really solemn today, it's because um, things are intense right now. And I wanted to just note, like I was thinking about this earlier, we today's Sunday and we put the podcast out on Tuesday. But I just think that I feel like I don't know if we're going to be on Tuesday. So I just wanted to point that out um, of like that we're in the middle of this right now. <laughs> and today we wanted to have a conversation um, specifically directed at white people, more specifically at white women, but everyone's obviously welcome to listen. Um, but I really uh, hope you you listen, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. that's where we're at right now. Yes. So this is Dear, Dear White Women and Dear, you know, Marie and Katie, this is to us. I, it is time, you know, this is for me. <laughs> this is for mm-hmm. you. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, you know, this is a difficult conversation. It makes us uncomfortable. Oh, heaven forbid. But there's no time like the present. A friend of mine actually sent me a text message this morning, and it said, it's better to be outraged and active than enraged and paralyzed. Yeah, I definitely am. A, I believe in that 100%. Yes. Yes. Been fighting people on Facebook all night. That's not active. <laughs> That's not an active choice. <laughs> Don't fight with people on Facebook. It's just not worth it. Uh, but yes, I've been, you know, really amped up. Um, and if you don't know what's going on, where have you been? Um, but if you if you really honestly don't know what's going on or what we're talking about, um, the gentleman by the name of F- George Floyd was murdered by a police officer on tape in uh, Minneapolis a few days ago. And again, the officers were just sort of getting away with it. And enough is enough. And they they were fired. It's not enough. They, you know, one officer now has been charged, but there was four involved in the incident. It's not enough. Is that officer going to be convicted? We don't know. And this has been going on for since the beginning of America. (laughs) And beyond, but, you know, certainly within our the history of our country. And um, I had a friend post something what I thought was very true, too, which was that, you know, this is great, but it would have been nice to see all this outrage about 40 viral videos ago. And why is it taking so long? Why is it now? And I think partly it's because we're stuck at home and we're more you're seeing this stuff. You can't hide from it as much. So people are out on the streets more. And the pandemic has has really targeted and, you know, black communities. They've been affected the most because of COVID-19. I just want to clarify, too, though, that the reason it's not just like, oh, African-Americans are also being more affected by COVID-19. How what a crazy coincidence. It's that because of systematic racism, the black communities are put in a position where they don't have as good access to health care. They don't have a lot of resources uh, that white people have had for years. Their health is generally worse because of systematic racism. So they're more susceptible to getting sick. So I just really wanted to clarify, it's not just like, because it's just, just so happens that, you know, some people are saying that like, oh, you know, just so happens black people happen to get it more genetics. It's like, nope, that's not what's going nope. on. Mm-mm. So anyway, it's socioeconomic. <laughs> it's right. trickling down. Yeah, right. Well, I also wanted to bring up the Amy Cooper video that's gone viral and that we've seen. Um, and some people have been saying because of that, this has been sparked, you know, it it's comes hand in hand. And it's been paired with the George Floyd. But that's a separate incident It's in itself. And I think that as white people, I wanted to just uh, talk about it briefly of that woman. The language that she used was weaponizing the man that she encountered. And that's that's white privilege right there. If we want to talk about what is white privilege, that is that's her knowing the the language that she she thought to protect her and that is so dangerous what they could have done if the police had shown up it is absolutely disgusting behavior and the fact that 
it's now circulating and and I mean it's just more fuel to this horrible fire that's happening in the U.S. right now. But I just think it's also imp- important to note that the thing that happened with Amy Cooper happens every day. It happens all the time. That's you know with the whole Karen thing. When you call the police on a black family who's barbecuing in a park totally legally, you are weaponizing your power <laughs> against those people. And uh, when you see a black person at a gas station pumping gas into his car and you think he looks suspicious, why, I don't know, th- then you call the police for a man who's pumping gas at a gas station, which is an article I read recently, too. That's weaponizing your power. And it it ha- we we and this is again why we're talking to w- white women are very much a part of this conversation because historically, this white women kind of uh, trying to quote unquote call out black male behavior in some way uh, is historically problematic for black men. Uh, the Tulsa riots started with a guy who. Most likely, it's really unclear what happened exactly, but most likely he like kind of tripped into a white woman who was running an elevator and then and the police didn't even prosecute. They were like, yeah, it was an accident or something or at worst, it was like a very minor thing. But the townspeople, no, they were like, used it as an excuse to burn an entire town down in Tulsa, Oklahoma in the 1920s. So, I mean, this is a long standing problem. and. um and the thing about Amy Cooper, it's it's all related. I mean, it's not unrelated. You know, this is all just a giant tapestry of horribleness <laughs> that we're right. experiencing <laughs> right now. Um, but yeah, so that's definitely it's part of the conversation. And that's also one of the reasons I think her story in particular was what made us go, oh, we should do this episode. And right. then since deciding we're going to do the episode, right. other things have been unfolding. I think what really what I took away from that video is how white people in this society have been empowered to say, I belong here, and then you don't. That is how this country has been built. I think that's an excellent segue into um, the notion of like, what is white privilege? Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a really, that's one very big, important part of what white privilege is, is that you as a white person are, are expect, you expect and are accepted basically anywhere and a person and a black person and people of color, but we're talking specifically about the black community today um, are not, (laughs) they're not allowed to be everywhere. Right. Right. I want to tell a quick little story just that happened to me a couple weeks ago because I am in Nashville and I'm staying at my parents' house. The doorbell rang and I went out and it was a young black man asking for money for his school organization this young kid was wearing a safety vest, a neon green safety, traffic safety vest in our neighborhood collecting money for his school. Why, you know, why do you think he feels the need to wear something like that in this white neighborhood? Of course. And it, it you know. And think about when you used to go, we talked Girl about Scout. Uh, Girl yeah. Scout cookies. Yeah, yeah. never, you... ever would I ever right. think that I would have to wear a neon green vest with reflectors on it to approach a, a house. Never. But this young man, you know, I just. Absolutely. Yeah. That's and white that privilege because we've never had to experience that. I, we don't right. we don't know what that feels like. Right. And I was thinking about our conversation today and I was ruminating over how I think this is the hardest part. This is the hardest part of the discussion, which is that white people have privilege. And there's a lot of resistance to this idea that white people have privilege just by the fact of the color, the mere fact that the color of their skin is white. And and I, I, there was this really great, so I had posted on um, Facebook that's been being passed around. It's, and we'll, I'm sure we'll talk more about it as we go, but uh, just a resource of, it's a Google doc of anti-racist resources. And uh, I've been going through those resources and looking at them. And one of the things that's on that document is uh, an article that was written by a white woman from, just like a professor at Wellesley. And she, it's called White Privilege Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack. And I thought this was just really, this perfectly explains to me what I think a lot of white people say when they're like, I'm not racist. I'm not racist. 
she's saying that racism isn't just an individual act of meanness. That's not what racism is. It's not one person being like, meh, you're black. Racism is an invisible system that confirms my race's dominance over other races. So the system, it's the system that we are all participating in and gaining from as white people that is a uh, racist. So you are gaining privilege and you're kind of participating in racist behaviors, whether you like it or not, whether you know it or not, whether you're able to fully see it or not. And this is the part I think that we really, this is the conversation that needs to be had over and over again within white communities. An acknowledgement that what's really hard for people is that we've been raised in school that you have gotten where you are based on your merits, based on what you've accomplished, your accomplishments as an individual. What we're not told is the real truth, which is that you were, had, you were placed in an advantage the day you were born. Everything you have, everything you have is not solely based on your merit. It doesn't mean you don't work hard. It doesn't mean you haven't worked for some of those things. It just means that at every step of the way, you've been given an extra tool that was not handed to a black person. And that's why the conversation of the American dream, when I hear people say that, you know, well, they have everybody is equal and everybody has, uh, you know, are born into America and they can fight, fight up the ranks and, and you know, succeed just like anybody else. That is just simply not true. And stating that and believing in the American dream that everyone has a fighting opportunity to be in the same place in society is just not true. And it's hard for us to unpack that. We've been indoctrinated with this notion of the American dream and of, you know, equality. And, that and it makes us feel you know, good to think that. Of course. Of course. But it's not true. When it ma <laughs> and it makes you feel bad to realize that it's not true. You know, it's there's a lot of resistance, mental resistance to this idea. That's why I just posted. I mean, I was like <laughs> posting like a crazy person on Facebook all day last night and then like today. And it's not helpful. I'm not recommending this tactic by any means. But at one point before I went to bed, I just because I was like, I have to stop. And I just posted Black Lives Matter, a Black Lives Matter picture. And I didn't say anything. I just posted that. And I was like, OK, just in some ways to me, it was like, this is what I'm trying to say. So let me just leave it at that. I woke up this morning had some likes, whatever. Um, and then there was a guy that was a, a quote unquote friend on Facebook who I did not know who this person was. And he just commented, hashtag all lives matter. Ugh. And I was like, and I've already been, I can't sleep. I'm already been in a rage, like whatever. So I was like, this is just not, I mean, this is just adding fuel to the fire. So quick rundown of what happened then. So I just sort of said, why do you feel the need to say this? And then he says, because it's true. And I'm like, yes, it's true. All lives matter. But that's not what this is about. And you saying all lives matter as a knee jerk reaction to me saying black lives matter is a slap in the face at best to to people just trying to fight for humanity and equality. And why do you feel the need to do that? What's if, you, if, if all lives matter, then you can agree that black lives matter. So why can't I just state a fact mm -hmm. <laughs> without you? policing by his statement and then and he said well i you know everyone's just saying that now willy-nilly actions matter more than words i was like i totally agree i was like so here's the thing why not today look at this google doc i posted the link i was like take a look at these things i really urge you to like spend the day with these things and ruminate over what is on these documents um and i think that would be a great action to take how about that and then he was like says you uh unfriended <laughs> and i was like that so that but to me and i wish he hadn't unfriended me so quickly because what i wanted to say was this is a perfect example of white fragility right that, you made I, him uncomfortable i challenged him you know what i mean i said like okay so i totally agree about action take an action and it's and but he doesn't have to. And like you said earlier this <laughs> during the podcast, it's like that's white privilege to be able to be like, no, I don't want to. Right. I had a friend over in the backyard the other night and we were talking about all of this. And he brought up uh, or actually his girlfriend brought up uh, a Facebook post of two friends of theirs, um, two uh, black friends of theirs are shopping for a mansion in, I think, Marin County 
in California. And this was just last week and they were shopping. Both of them have incredible jobs. One works for Twitter, another works for Facebook. You know, they're on the tech side of things, making good money and stuff. And so they're going to buy a mansion. So they're shopping around. They had a black realtor showing them some spaces. And they said that um, in this Facebook post that two white neighbors came out, said to the realtor, if you're going to show any uh, this house, you have to let us know, the neighbors, when they're showing a house, and then proceeded to silently judge and and somewhat th- you know threaten or you know make them make it very clear that they were not welcome in that neighborhood. So we're talking about this and how disgusting that is. But then my friend says, "But I don't know anybody like that." Do you know have anybody in your circle group that would act like that? And I said, "You know, saying that is making you feel like it's okay. You're picking and choosing What story, what your story is. Okay, maybe you don't have people in your inner circle, but I'll tell you what, are you just telling me right now then that that doesn't exist? We're just constantly changing the narrative to make us feel better. Right. And um, that, by the way, is a very clear gaslighting. Right. It's saying, I don't really believe you. Right. I don't know anyone like that. I don't right. believe you. Right. And uh, that's another thing that's very, very common is this idea of, you know, someone will be like, well, why are white women acting all crazy or something like that'll be like a tweet, whatever. I'm just whatever. general. And then a white woman will respond. Well, not all white women. <laughs> and you're like, you just gaslighted that person, first of all, by it, it's basically denying that 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 person had an issue with somebody or something that went down that was race related or whatever. But also, like you said, it's shifting the narrative in this way that's really not cool. And we so another thing about it is that in th- this white privilege unpacking the invisible knapsack, she um she w- was a Wellesley professor, right? So she was into fe- feminist issues, and you know, and certainly we've talked about how feminism has very much gone through the lens of white feminism, which is problematic. But I will say this. And this is why I feel like I want to talk. I'm hopeful about our listeners specifically during this conversation is that I do think it's worth it's worth kind of seeing some of the parallels. And I want to clarify that a parallel between struggles does not mean that they're the same. And I don't want to hear people go, this is, you know, and I've fallen into this trap, but it's like, who has it worse? You know, women Mm -hmm. are black people and really, you know, this is it's all intertwined. It's all one. It's all interwoven. But also we're not talking about white women problems right now Mm-mm. we're talking about black community problems um and but one of the things that i am hopeful about and why i think white women specifically are getting a lot of because we're like, why are people so mad at white women right now it's because as a woman of any race but as a white woman you have experienced inequality you have experienced what it feels like to be gaslit you 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 know what it feels like to be living in an invisible system in which a man doesn't see the inequality you know what i mean Mm -hmm. so like if you're if you're trying to you you, as white ladies that are listening to this podcast i know that you know that when you're trying to get that promotion you're working twice as hard and then they give it to jerry anyway that's invisible system also exists in a race way and i think that i just I only bring that up again, not to compare sorrows and any of that, that we're leaving that at the door. We're not doing that. But I do want to try if you're not believing people at its face value, if you're not believing that the system is stacked against the black community, then look at how the you know that the system is stacked against women. You know, it is. Mm-hmm. So but and, and, and you can see that people don't fully you know, men don't see it. So. Isn't it possible that you don't see as a white person that the society is stacked against the black community and you're benefiting from it? Mm-hmm. You are. <laughs> and that was another way that she phrased it in this in this article. She was saying if a black person is at a disadvantage because of the color of their skin for like a job or for a house, for renting a house or buying a house, then doesn't that put you at an advantage because of the color of your skin? Mm -hmm. You have to be able to see both sides of that coin. There was a couple other examples, if you don't mind. She had 50 examples that she had written down of how she was observing her own 
white privilege. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to read all 50 because that would be <laughs> insane. But there was a couple I just thought maybe would resonate. People are still struggling with this idea. If they're like, but, but, but this, but that, but this. Um, you know, she can turn on the television or open the front page of the paper and see people of her race widely represented. Our, our race. We can we can open right. the newspaper and see. That's privilege. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I'm never asked to speak for all people of my racial group. Mm. That's white privilege. Mm-hmm. I can swear or dress in secondhand clothes and not answer a letter or something or an email without having people attribute these choices to bad morals, uh, to the poverty or the illiteracy of my race. You know, like you can wear, just think about that for one second. You can wear a secondhand clothing and not have people question right. your poverty <laughs> or something crazy. So, I mean, my culture gives me little fear about ignoring the perspectives and powers of people of other races. If I decide I don't want to learn about black history, it doesn't really affect my life. Mm. But if a black person chooses to not learn you Amer- you know American white history, then they fail a class. <laughs> right. They right. they're at they're at risk of being killed if they're not following white norms. They're at risk of being fired if they don't follow white norms. If your hair is natural, you might get fired. Mm-hmm. If you're if you're just being yourself, you may not get hired. You may not get that job. You may not get that apartment you want to rent. If you're just being you. So, you know, mm-hmm. that's what white privilege is. Mm-hmm. But also, just to go back to the history of what I've really fallen in love with this woman named Rachel Cargill, I believe her name is. Um, And she has, last night she actually posted a really eloquently spoken uh, speech about the revolution and why now is, the revolution is now and how you have to uh, take action more than ever at this point right now. Um, But if you go to her Patreon, she actually, and you can donate whatever you are able to at this point. um, And she has a syllabus for the unlearning of black history, basically, of America. And being here in Nashville, it's so in your face. You know, you drive down I-65 and there is a Confederate general statue right on. It's on private property. And believe it or not, up until I don't even know how many, maybe 10 years ago, the statue was surrounded by Confederate flags. And there were so many protests and and um, uh, uh, graffiti and stuff on the statue um, that they started. They did change the flags to like Tennessee state flags or something. But the statue still exists there. Last night here in Nashville, a statue on the state capitol was pulled down of a known. He was a journalist. He was a racist, a known racist. And there's a statue right downtown. Of course, it has to be pulled down. I just can't imagine. I mean, you know, people that are fighting about it's the American history and we have to still, you know, it's just part of history. And these statues exist still. I, I that that again is white privilege. That is the narrative that we feel comfortable telling ourselves and our children as white people. But that is not, as a black person, I cannot imagine what that must feel like to be driving down 65 and seeing that statue of the Confederate soldier every goddamn day I went to work. Mm-hmm. And if you're having a hard time relating, or if you're just sort of listening to that story and going, oh, man, that is a shame. That is a real shame. Yes, yes, that's a shame. Uh, that's not enough. L- think about it this way. Imagine your rapist mm-hmm. was, you know, a famous lawyer or something. And they decided to erect a statue of him in the middle of your town. And you had to drive by your rapist <laughs> right, every damn day. But also, so, yeah, but it's also the founding fathers. They did sure. not have black people in mind when they wrote the, com- the Constitution. No. They also, I found there's a lot of, speaking of like being more aware of like actual history, um, there's a book that I'm really interested in reading and of course i don't know what the title of the book is but um it's basically about uh white women as slave owners Mm. 
and how white women participated. We don't talk about how white no. women participated in the slave trade at all. We like to pretend like we were just not a part of it. Like, I don't know. I'm sitting in the corner. But in fact, uh, white women owned more slaves than their husbands did usually because they needed to do this and have this done and clean the house and whatever. Um so that's like think think those kinds of stories are not being taught in school. Mm -mm. Uh, and, and in addition to that, in addition to the realities of like how harsh and how unfair that you know when you said the founding fathers weren't thinking about black people when they were writing the Constitution. Um, in addition to that, though, there's a lot of people, a lot of black people that have contributed positively to our history that just get erased. Mm -hmm. So I mean. It, I think number one, there's something about like reframing the narrative, right? About what we what we do know, but then also adding the stories that are positive. <laughs> it doesn't have to always be like everything, you know. And then we raped and pillaged, raped and pillaged. Yes, yes, yes. We have to talk about that. But also, this guy invented this thing and it changed our lives. And then that white guy took credit for it, <laughs> you know. But let's right. give credit back, you know. I mean, things right. like that. I think are really useful. What is so cool about her syllabus is is how the actions that us white people can take. And I think that instead of I've, I've been seeing a lot of posts about, you know, asking your black friends for pointers. Yeah, please <laughs> Even, stop doing that. <laughs> please stop doing that. But also, I mean, this morning I was looking at Rachel's um, Instagram and a white woman me messaged her asking her for help. And it's that white glove, you know do this for me so I don't have to work as hard. Whereas like, you know, she could have just clicked the fucking link in her Instagram. But right. <laughs> I mean, come but that's on, just you like guys. Constant. Why it, it's us white ladies who are just, you know, society just hands us things constantly. And that is what we have expected. We don't want to do the work. We want to just have it handed to us. And, and also it helps us remain victimized. Right. If we say, I don't know what I'm doing. What am I doing wrong? I don't. Please help me. Somebody help me. I'm a victim. I'm a victim. It's like, bitch, go open your Google. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> what the fuck? But with what Rachel is saying and that spoke directly to me, because she really does focus on you, 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 you. What are you going to do? What are the actions? And in her uh, speech on YouTube last night that really struck me of just breaking it down, and that's uh, critical knowledge, really be able to um, take the time to seek out black narratives, uh, you know, the stories that we are not familiar with and educate ourselves because we do not know. Like you're saying, there's this invisible society that exists that we have just been able to, f you know, frolic along freely. But there's a whole other story going on. And it's we cannot be be, you know, closing our eyes to it anymore. It's time to rise up. Um, so it's it's educating yourself. Um, and it's you know, we're all we can claim that we're empathetic to black lives. Um, but now is the time more than ever to be uh, radically empathetic to these people. Um, and and that means holding yourself accountable. And, you know, now if you see it with your own eyes, it's time to take action, to call it out, to like, and, and Katie, I've always been so inspired by you because you never, ever back down. If there's something that you see online, you always go at it and you try and you do it in a very empathetic way. And, but, and you're kind and, and, but you, I've, I've never seen you back down at a chance to be, um, to empathize with somebody and to just come together and, and, and have a conversation like you said about that guy that said all lives matter. Um, so, you know, we can take lessons from that. And then one last thing is just intentional action and, and what we can do. Um, and that's, uh, I think with what she's saying about that is that, you know, find, um, black businesses because capitalism obviously props up white people, <laughs> I mean, no matter in every aspect of this country. Um, and I think that more than ever, I was seeing like, you know, and this is so even such a small percentage, but it was saying, you know, support black business at 15% of the time that you purchase anything, make sure you're, you're supporting a black business, a, a local business. Um, 
and 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 more importantly she was saying like there's no ro- ro- there's no room for being passive at this point and it's and right now it's it's people over property people over products and people over profit and i think that that is that's black lives matter you know so yeah. That people over profit, I think, is something we're also dealing with with the COVID thing. So even right. before all the the protesting, um, we were seeing that the people were not did right. not matter to these people trying to make profits. Um, so I, that those are great things to to do and to be active about. Um, I also wanted to mention that we're <sighs> this work sometimes feels like you're being attacked, right? So people get really defense. White women get very defensive when they're called out on stuff and they're very, you know, this white fragility is what they label it. But but it's a real feeling, right? There's a real feeling of like, what did I do? But what if I, I'm not trying to do anything wrong? I'm I'm a good I'm the good guy. I'm trying to be, you know, I, I, I like people. I'm not racist and all that. And I just want to clarify that that instead of this when you're going through this work and you're finding out the truths about all of this stuff that's actually been going on around you, which you didn't realize, is that uh, instead of falling into a pit of despair and denial, which is a big thing we see, and self-loathing. So if you know either you're denying it and you're like, that's not me, or you just are like, oh, my God, I'm so horrible. I've been participating in this system. I, this wonderful thing I read about white caucusing, which we'll talk about later, um, is t- talks about how this is a process of liberation and healing. And you're healing yourself. You're healing your community. You're healing your heart. You're healing your mind from this nonsense that you've been fed your whole life. Um, and not it's not about hating yourself or like feeling. I mean, you can feel a little guilty. I'm not saying you shouldn't feel guilty to some degree, but it, but it's not so productive to feel guilty, right? It's more productive to feel like, okay, I'm going to make these changes because I, I want to be liberated to the truth. And I want my community and the people in my, my neighbors, my friends, my family to be liberated um, and healed and heal the relationships. I think that's just a better way to frame it so that it doesn't feel like so overwhelming and so... Um, you know, like you'll shut down if you're like, I can't do anything about it. Right. <laughs> you know, and that's not what well, we I've been seeing so many of, of white women, you know, making it about themselves. And it, now is not the time. Yes. My friends. It's not yeah. not about yeah. you. Unless it's about you being terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, then sure. The sure post <laughs> away. <laughs> we'll like it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's great. Um, and I also want to clarify, too, that like. Uh, You know, as we're talking about all these things, like I and I've been going through stuff. There's a million and one things that I've done consciously, unconsciously, all the above that have um, been misguided with the ways that I thought about things, ways I thought about this stuff. This isn't something I was born knowing. I've had to be slowly teaching myself. I don't know everything. I'm not even close yet. But um, I'm trying to learn and I'm I want to learn and I want other people to want to learn. I was reflecting on my life uh, and in high school, this is so tone deaf. I think that that is something that I think that throughout my, you know, growing up here in Nashville, there was a lot of instances where I participated in things that were completely tone deaf to the reality of what they actually were. And one of the instances I'll never forget is that we went to DC as my choir group And it was a mission trip. And we really did focus on, you know, poor communities of people. And we would go in and sing to them, thinking like, you know, how what a wonderful thing to do. It's like, but it's us being like white martyrs in a way. We went into the, and we all had to sign waivers because it was a very, very dangerous community. We went in and we sang African spiritual music. Oh, God. (laughs) They're probably like, what is yeah. happening? <laughs> but, you know, it made us feel good. Yeah, that's the that's thing. That's the thing. There are so yeah. many actions that we have been doing that make us white people feel good. But then, you know, now that I'm older and thinking back on those experiences, like oh, how completely tone deaf and how, how just there's so many, there were so many other ways that we could have been, um, you know, doing the mission of God or whatever. I, I have problems with missionaries and, and, you know, because of all of this. But um, 
I think back to that and it just, it makes me really, you know, it's really sad that that's, that, that I didn't have the awareness at that time to be like, wait a minute, what the fuck are we doing right now, you guys? This is all about us. This is right. making us feel better, not them. So I think that that is something that also we can look at what we do, what our actions, why are we doing them to make us feel better, to make us feel less uncomfortable. And and I'll tell you, it, it, that, that's also a good example of how, um, and again, a lot of, it, it's very easy to fall into a victim mode and this kind of thing. But it is mm-hmm. also just true. Like, this is the invisible system. You were indoctrinated with the system. So you you really didn't see stuff. You know what I mean? You legitimately didn't. You do what you're told. You see what you were told to see. Um, but that's, that's uh, it's not okay. But it's... Um, but now <laughs> we can stop doing that. Now we're seeing things. Now we can teach our children differently. Now we can change the narrative, you know, and make it honest. Um, I I would love to go through some of these sort of um, common excuses and common um, defenses that white people put up um, to try to pivot the conversation or the arguments that they like to throw back at us. Um, a big one, just talked about it today. <laughs> all lives matter. Um, yeah, that's true. All lives matter. <laughs> so you're, you're right, buddy. <laughs> you're not wrong. But, you know, not all lives are at higher risk of being murdered by cops. No. Not all lives are at higher risk of being unfairly incarcerated. All lives can't go for a jog without yeah, without being, being worried. murdered. In yeah. any neighborhood they want. Right. You know, right. Not all lives can uh, get that promotion, even though they deserve it, <laughs> because right. race, racist Phil is like, no, not today. Right. This one, this next one is one that I struggled with for a really long time. I'm not proud to say. Uh, and that is what was he or she doing when like when these you know horrible incidents with the cops happen? What was that individual doing to provoke the cop? It couldn't possibly have been. Um, I mean, he must have done something wrong. Like, why would the cop do that to him? Right. This is one I really struggled with. And I realize now it's like I was saying, we live in two different Americas. If I went into a store and used a, um, a counterfeit bill, uh, at worst, if they assume that I had brought that bill on purpose, which they wouldn't because I'm a white girl, but if they did, I wouldn't be dead because of it. And and this idea that, well, he must have done something more. It must, there must be more to this picture than just that. Because why would that cop do that? It's like racism. <laughs> That's why. And that was such, so hard for me to, I could not wrap my brain around that for a really long time. For me, the the big, and I think everyone has their different turning points with these things. For me, the turning point, and again, I'm not proud to say it took me this long to fully start changing my paradigm, the in my brain about this but it was the mike brown murder watching that video and seeing like oh yeah he didn't yes there was an altercation but then turned around he had his hands up and he didn't have a gun and they shot him anyway i was like oh that wouldn't happen to me (laughs) right that couldn't happen to me and we've been talking about it my parents and i and my dad you know he said why didn't anybody do anything with george floyd why didn't there were people around obviously there's somebody filming why didn't anybody do anything? And it's because they would have been shot. Even And honestly, even if it had been a white person trying to, what is a white person going to even do? Pull the cop off the guy? I mean, it's that's where we have this weird thing with the cop situation where you, if they're not even, if we took this much protesting to even get that guy, you know, uh, charged, the one guy, right. not even the four, the one guy right. charged, you think that, Somebody can go up to that cop and try to pull him off that guy without being even if they didn't murder the white guy, they they charge the white guy. They wouldn't charge. You know, what I mean, they charge the guy interfering with police work or right. whatever. So it's not like you don't it's that's not how that works. You don't do anything in the moment to stop it. You don't have people working in as a police officer if you can't be a good police officer. I mean, and it's when you when saying, why didn't anybody do something? Why did why is the cop have his knee on a man's neck for 
I mean, first of all, you're not allowed to do that as a police officer, period. That's a chokehold. It's an illegal chokehold. So he should be have been arrested for just that. Just just that part of it. He deserves to be in jail. But um, yeah, and then he murdered somebody. So doubly so. But also like, you know, so th- this isn't an issue. Why didn't the other cops do something? They actually have the power to do something. And they didn't. So, I mean, if that's what you want to argue. The other thing I would love to say, too, about like, well, what was he or she doing before the incident? Um, my other answer to that is, who the fuck cares? Who the fuck cares? If he mouthed off, if he uh, if he was high on drugs, who cares? So so this guy, at worst, at worst, tried to use a counterfeit bill and knew it, which I doubt he knew. I mean, come on. That's not we any of us could have a counterfeit twenty dollar bill in our wallets right now and not know. So that's one thing. But um, not only was he murdered for something so trivial like that, but how can that guy then be murdered? And then that guy that shot up the church, they stop at fucking Taco Bell for him or whatever. They get him. So he's hungry. That guy that uh, they just caught him in Maryland just like a week ago for murdering two people. He's a Yukon student. He murdered two people. He was on the run because he knew he murdered two people. They caught him without killing him. Then he said he was thirsty. And they gave him a bottle of water. Guess who else said he was thirsty? George Floyd. So not a good not a good excuse, guys. Sorry. Not a good look. Yeah. Another one that's been popping up a lot is that there's it's mostly good cops out there. You know, we say we show a video of a cop murdering somebody and then we say, but most cops are good. Who the fuck cares? <laughs> that cop's not good. How'd he get in there? Why aren't we why aren't we why aren't we doing anything about it? Um, Killer Mike gave this amazing speech in Atlanta. It was just so upsetting. And he's just like, I don't want to be here. I don't want to give this speech. But he talks about how his um many, many people in his family are in the police force. He said, I love the police force. We need police. We have to have a police force to to keep society running. Yeah, I'm not against police, but I am against the way the police system is being run currently. It's a military, like a uh, militarized police force that we're stepping into. And it's specifically and that, militarized against black people. <laughs> against black people. You know, especially. Right, right. Well, well there just has to be, if you're going to be a police officer, there has to be more than eight weeks of training. There has, there, there has to be, these people have to be held accountable for when they're being trained. I don't know how, I mean, I, I, I don't know much about what, how that works, but obviously there needs to be way more education going involved in, um, in how to train police, police officers. This is, they should, you know, as teachers, when I was teaching, you're given tools to de-escalate fights within the hallway. Why aren't that? Why isn't that? You're telling me the only way to de-escalate some sort of um, fight or a counterfeit, you know, twenty dollar bill is to hold your knee on his neck? No, there has to be, and we have to be holding these police the police accountable. And that was one thing. Another thing that Rachel said that I think is amazing is to be calling. And, uh, calling out your local police and um, and taking away the money to to militarize them more and actually taking that money, defunding police and and taking that money and actually putting it back into the community. A hundred percent. With local organizations that are helping, you know, with this sort of thing. And again, thing. I'm not saying and I don't think you're saying that we should not have a police force. I think some people are maybe trying to say that. But no, I think we absolutely need a police force. Uh, but we need a police force that's healthy and functioning properly. The other thing I would say about the de-escalation is that how come, though, how come, though, they the police seem to be able to de-escalate situations with armed white people with no problem, but they're unable to de-escalate situations with um, with, with, an, with, with an unarmed black person? You know, when some when, how are they unable to de-escalate a situation of someone like Philando Castile, who's in his car, pulled over for a traffic violation, small infra- infraction, maybe, you know, I don't even know what that was about, knows he knows he has a gun on him, which is legal, 100 percent legal gun. It's totally registered. He has it legal, legal firearm because Second Amendment, whatever that, fuck, you know, right. Isn't everyone allowed to have a gun? OK, so. He gets pulled over. He puts his hands on the wheel. He's very careful, very articulate. The po- police officer, like, freaks out. 
He tells the police officer, I, I just want you to know I have a firearm. And the police officer goes, don't pull it out. Don't reach for your firearm. And he's like, I'm not going to reach for my firearm. I'm going to reach for my ID. And he's like, don't pull out your firearm. Don't pull out your firearm. And then freaks out and shoots him like six times. That is that de-escalating a situation? What is happening? While watching videos of the protests in Brooklyn yesterday, you see a black person fighting, you know, with the police and then a white woman lunging in to help and the police back down. Right. And that's what they've been taught. Right. That's what's ingrained. Right. Right. Also, by the way, side note, uh, that's also why it's really important why white people step up. Because unfortunately, uh, other white people don't always listen to b black people. They only listen to white people and they only, you know, make a change for white people. So just so that's clear. Another thing that um, Kenny DeForest, one of our comedy friends, said on Facebook, I thought it was a good point. He was at the protests and he was, uh, uh, you know, noticing what was going on in the protests. And he said something about how, you know, if we live in a world that's unsafe for black people and the cops, there's a lot of violence, cop violence against black people and the communities, you know, feel unsafe and there's just no safety. It's not safe for the cops either. Mm. It's not good for anybody. It's not good for anybody. No. Yeah. No. Oh. And and in 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 respect to the good cop bad cop thing, we you you I think the number one thing that we need to change is we have to hold these people accountable when they commit a crime. And mm -hmm. and and a so-called good cop, and you know we have some cop friends and we love our cop friends, but I and I would speak if they're listening right now, I'd like to speak to them too and say, uh, we believe you're a good person, we do, but also. What are you doing to hold the bad cops accountable? And if you don't do anything and you're complicit in their getting away with murder, does that what kind of a good cop does that make you? Does that make you a good cop? What kind, you know who what does that do? So I think that even internally, not even not I think in almost the first thing that has to happen is the police force internally has to go, "Oh, we have a problem." <laughs> <laughs> when somebody does something illegal, I mean, just an illegal chokehold, that that should be prosecuted. There should be a zero tolerance for that, whether there's a death or not, whether that person, quote unquote, deserved it or not. If that's an illegal move, you get you get reprimanded for that. Let's go on to the next, because um, I've been hearing a lot of it or seeing it, uh, is that rioting does nothing. Doesn't solve the problem. Solve, yeah. Well, first of all, how so many riots have caused change, so that's wrong. Right. <laughs> I mean, people have been turning a lot to the um, the uh, Stonewall Inn riots, and that's was the the spark that changed uh, rights for gay and trans people. So rioting does kind of work, but <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but the but also. I, I have so much to say about this right now. Do you want to say something? Because I just. No. I, well, I'm curious. I, I'll talk about what the conversation I had with my friend who was fighting about saying that they are bad. Well, so this is what I was mostly fighting with people on Facebook about last night until like five in the morning. Um, but number one, the very first thing I want to say is if you're really worked up about the looting and the rioting, uh, first of all, that's a very small percentage of the people that are out there protesting. So it's weird that that's what you're focused on. But I understand you're seeing your city burn or something. And it's very upsetting and, and difficult to see. Uh, but I have to ask you, if you're really upset about the rioting and looting, why can you imagine how frustrating it would be for a black person when they you hear you complaining, but the looting, but the rioting, and they don't see any equivalent outrage over the injustice of the black community being subjected to violence? You're you're and, and I said this well, this is one of my I kind of like <laughs> my opening statement in this one Facebook argument was people focus 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 <laughs> you're looking in the wrong direction dude <laughs> like what's happening right um so there's all of that right also if you're 
if you've had a thumb on you for all of the history of the United States and, and you try to peacefully protest, Colin, Colin Kaepernick, nope, you're not allowed to do that. You try to do a, a peaceful walk protest and people and you do an all a, a Black Lives Matter protest. That's not acceptable because, quote unquote, you know, all lives matter, blah, all that shit. You can't you've done everything you can. You've done everything you can. There's nothing left. We've the, the black community has given us plenty of opportunity to listen to them. And we've refused to listen. Um, so, of course, some people are going to be angry enough to loot and stuff. The other thing about this, and I don't know how much you've been watching this, but I was watching it kind of unfold in real time last night as I could not get off the Internet and the news. But um, a huge majority of the looting that has start been started and the rioting that has started has been started by white people. Uh, it's mm -hmm. been there's now more and more and more proof that there have been white uh, supremacists that have come in to try to like stir up trouble. In Nashville, mm -hmm. there's a lot of white people causing mm -hmm. the looting and very few black people in the pictures mm -hmm. that I saw, at least. Um, there's also a whole consortium of very far left people that are starting these looting and things because there is this very, I don't know if you call them liberal, but super far left liberal people. Um, dare I say, <laughs> I'm just gonna make someone so mad right now, but dare I say like the extremist, extremist Bernie bro types that really want to see the world burn. They're using this as an excuse to like get that burning going. What's really unfortunate about that is that guess who gets blamed for it? That white guy burns the, you know, some building down and the black community suffers. So, it, you know, that's so you think you're fighting. for I don't know what those people are fighting for, particularly other than just burning the system down. Um, and then in addition to that, there was a cop who was dressed. Right. Up. I did see. Yeah. That. And he started the initial riot looting. At a, I keep wanting to call it a CarMax because I don't drive. Jiffy Lube, oh, CarMax. AutoZone. 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 Right. <laughs> I like the CarMax. <laughs> um, but he, <laughs> I keep referring to it as that. But he, they've now proven that it is a cop. People are like, it wasn't a cop. The, the, the police force said, no, it's not a cop. It's not a cop. His ex-girlfriend ID'd him. She's like, that's my gas mask. Mm. Jesus Christ. Yeah. So and she's right. like, that's his walk. That's his body language. That's his voice. Those are his eyes. And that's my gas mask. <laughs> So like, oh it's definitely God. him. And and the reason why that's if you're like, why would they do that? Why would they do that? I want to just tie back to that thing that the president just said, uh, when the looting starts, the shooting starts. But guess what? If the looting never starts, then they can't shoot. So they have to make sure that the looting starts so they have something to crack down on. If it was just if they didn't, if they weren't provoking anything, then it would be a peaceful protest and... Right. How well, it's also been them. proven that in Minneapolis, a lot of people were coming into town for it. Not the people in the community. It was people out of town coming in to loot, riot and stuff. One of our cop friends actually posted about that on Facebook and said he was like, there's a lot. Of, if you don't think that people aren't coming in from out of town to this town that he works in, there's a lot of cars in this parking lot. Mm. I don't know. Like, I don't I, I'm pretty damn sure that that's what's happening. Well, I was seeing on the news, too, uh, I believe it was in St. Louis because it was Nikki Glaser who was posting about it. She was her and her parents were, you know, added on her Instagram stories of watching the news. And her parents were like pointing out all the white people in this uh, particular riot area. And again, I think it was St. Louis. But you can clearly see three white guys pushing black people into the police so the police then fight back right they push and push and push and push and then they run away like little fucking cowards right so there is you know and and we've been talking about this too within my house is that uh, you know obviously the rioting when you have been oppressed like and nobody is listening then the then you know then that is where this is coming from the other side of it, and I even hate to say this, but all this, it's really good for Trump. Sure. It's making us, yeah, it's splitting us even more. These, But it's if the white supremacists are coming in there and doing this, it's splitting us even more. It's This whole thing is so bad. And it and it's a revolution. And let me tell you, things are, it, it, it's, I don't know. I think that I, I read something also, too, that this is 
we have to stay on the positive side of this, that there is absolutely no way that Trump will not get voted out of office after all of this shit, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, if we can harness if, it, if properly. we can harness it, yeah. yes, exactly. Uh, so the other thing I wanted to mention too, and I agree with everything you just said, that uh, the other thing you're witness. So I again, I was watching all this weird stuff on Facebook <laughs> unfold in real time, and people that I know that I'm friends with on Facebook were attending um, the protests throughout different towns so there was one guy in fort wayne who was sort of live reporting his experience and then there was uh people in columbus those two protests went wrong real fast because of the police so um people were just in columbus was one where the people were just peacefully protesting they had a lot at the time they had done everything properly they were supposed to protest from 10 to 12 that was the agreement that the city had with them and everybody's peacefully protesting and then at 11 o'clock without any warning the police the police just started tear gassing the crowd there was no announcement like you're not you know you're not staying in the street you're doing something there was no announcement it was just and then they said that almost like clockwork every 20 minutes they would just randomly ga tear gas people and that was been like a strategy of the police in some of these cities i'm not saying every city but like I think that happened in Nashville because there's a cur there was a, a curfew, a very early curfew, and that people at the minute after they were starting to like tear gas people, yeah. I believe. But even this one was in the morning. It was ten in the morning oh, to Jesus noon. Christ. It wasn't even like it was like the beginning of the protest. Um, so there's a lot of antagonizing coming from the police department too in certain cities. Um, and again, that if that doesn't make you mad, then it's you know that that would make me want to turn down a car max or whatever <laughs> but um but also aside from that then i think it's also not worth looking at a lot of the rioters and looters because so many of the voices uh, the frontline voices of the protest are saying stop looting stop looting mm -hmm. there's this amazing right. video of um of the target that was uh looted and you can see in the video you should try to find these things uh it's all these white boys some they have mm -hmm. like skateboards like kids that are and they're just they don't even know what they're looting they're just doing it because they're aggressive teenagers you know and they're breaking right. and this woman has a bullhorn and she's clearly one of the organizers and she's a black woman and she's near tears just just screaming please stop please stop please stop and they're not like imagine that imagine you're not right. even being listened to by your quote-unquote fellow protesters right your voice is well that's the away. well that's the amazing thing is that you know there was a protest here there was a rally here in nashville yesterday and it was organized by a local community you know um organization and they had it down to a t park here we meet here it's between these times like the the rallies for peace are 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 organized by professionals right this isn't and yeah this is an excuse for this you to isn't go a out free and, for all right. no and so and and they it was to be a peaceful protest and i had a friend um my friend jordan she sent me a message saying that she had gone to the protest and um, it was actually, she actually sent me, it was a Marco Polo. So it was a video of her saying how inspired she felt. It was really a peaceful protest. There was a lot of people there all keeping social distance with masks. And, and then, she, then like a couple hours later, she sent me, well, I guess things have developed pretty bad downtown. You know, it took a turn. I don't know what happened because when I was there, it was like this. And now it's and she was no longer there. So we were just seeing it on the news. But again, I would just so if you're seeing that or you're a part of that, just remember, it's not the organizers. It's not the people that want justice for George Floyd and for everybody that's been, you know, f harassed by police and et cetera. It's that's not what the those protesters want. They don't want those things burnt down. They don't want that. It's a very select few individuals that are pushing for that. And most of those people are not in line with what we're really fighting for here. If that makes sense. Also, I want to know who looted uh, the hattery downtown Nashville. They took all those hats out. I want to see those hats being paraded around Nashville. <laughs> I mean, you know, hats for everybody. <laughs> hats for everybody. And that was another thing. There's, it was. I saw on Fox News there was like uh, yesterday before the second round of all this stuff was going on, and it was just Minneapolis. And there was a Fox News article, of course, was interviewing a black business owner whose business had been looted, and they basically leaned really hard into like, look at people destroying their own communities. And then there was like an article in somewhere else that was uh, another business owner who's a black business 
business owner whose business had been looted and they interviewed him and he said, uh, it's okay. It's just stuff. He's like, it's worth it. Right. You know? So I think that yeah. also trying to control the narrative of the people who are of trying to control the narrative of black people is happening even in the middle of this <laughs> thing, you know? Right. So that's worth, yeah. Be careful where you're getting your news from, I guess. But I mean, always. Right. There was an Indian, uh, a store owner in Minneapolis who his daughter actually posted for him um, and she said that he said let it burn just yeah. let it burn I stand with black lives love it you know yeah. and so that's great yeah not that we want everything to burn but you know anyway okay moving on uh, this is one that I just saw on Facebook a couple of days ago and I was like what the fuck and the argument was well the cop didn't explicitly kill that kill George Floyd uh, you know and, and this can happen with anybody, right? So they didn't, he didn't kill, he wasn't the cause of the death. You know, he just, you know, so he had a pre existing condition or he was on drugs. And, you know, in, in, in George Floyd's case, they, um, I guess the autopsy said there were three things. He had a heart condition that contributed to his death. He, they had some intoxicant in his system, which could have been a beer. It could have been a Sudafed. I mean, I don't know. They were very unclear about what it is. And then the third thing that contributed was, uh, you know, ha being choked to death, <laughs> you know. Um, so this guy posts this, like, autopsy report being like, it, you know, just going to say that it wasn't just like, it wasn't really the cop's explicit movement that killed him. I'm like, what? What kind of an argument is this? Oh, my God. And I, Get the I, fuck out of here. All I said to him back was I was like, do you think, I'm just curious, do you think he would have died that day if it wasn't for the cops' actions? That's the question. And right. he was like, well, I mean, maybe. I'm like, I, I don't know. <laughs> that's mm -mm. not true. No. And Yeah. But that's a good response, Katie. Well, I was I just think, curious. I was like, know, I'm just curious. You think he would have died that day? Is that what you're trying to say to me is that he was... You know, he was on he was in hospice care at the ho at the cancer ward and that like he was one breath away from death. And then the cop just happened to put his knee on his neck. I mean, that's not right. what happened. I saw a funny thing this morning saying, like, why do you think black people have such high blood pressure? It's all this fucking stress. <laughs> I mean, how I would 100 <laughs> percent believe that that's partially true. Right. right. I, 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 I wouldn't doubt that for one second. Um, another pivot that I've been seeing a lot of from certain people that are, so, again, so uncomfortable with having to be faced with the realities of this is, I think this is so stupid, too. Somebody was saying, uh, well, what about the illegals that kill innocent people? Right. Our president really likes to tout that around. What? First of all, that's not what we're talking about today. <laughs> you no. know what I mean? No. Mm -mm. Second of all, what, give me, show me an illegal that killed somebody recently. I don't, I mean, there's not... Also, why are we calling them illegals? That's a whole other thing. Show me a, a human being that has illegally crossed the border that, you know, what are, are these rampant numbers? It's not that it doesn't happen. How about we how about this instead? How about we get mad about the white terrorists that are mass murdering children in schools? Right. How about that? <laughs> I mean, what, what, we're not talking about that today. We should, we should be talking about yeah. that another day. But, you know. Right. That's definitely a bigger conversation for sure. But yeah, but it's, yeah. It's, it's just, just deflecting the problem onto something else. And it's not it's again, it, we go back to this and I keep going back to it. It's just if any it may if it makes you uncomfortable, you can deflect. You have that privilege to be able to throw it on something else and not take it on yourself. It, uh, it's not my problem. It's right. Somebody else's. So, um, yeah, I mean, and also like I could respond that's to that blatant racism. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but I could also if someone saying what about the illegal about illegals that kill innocent people? I could also easily respond to that. What about the murder hornets that are killing people? Mm. I mean, we could just talk about anything at that point. What about, you know, what about this itch I have in the, my butt crack today? What about that? I mean, that's unfair. <laughs> Why do I have that? You know, like, it's what, what are you talking right. about? It's such a non sequitur. Right. What about all the saturated fat and McDonald's that's ki silently killing oh, all of us? But, Why excellent. don't we talk yes. about that? Yeah. Why don't we yeah, talk about our president no. who's causing all this fucking bullshit? I mean, we could talk about lots of things, but that's not what we're talking right. about today. Right. Um, another one I just saw in that same feed was racial disparity is a crock of shit. That it doesn't exist. And we uh, kind of covered this already. But that it's invisible. You may not see it, but mm -hmm. it doesn't mean it's not there. I don't even have more to say about that per se. Well, I'll, I'll tell you oh. one thing real quick. My sister did say um, that she had posted something about the Amy Cooper and somebody quickly responded in her friend group that said that that had nothing to do with race the amy cooper situation had nothing to do with race. she she even before she called the cops 
told the guy she was going to tell the cops that he was black. She said it herself. It's that's only about race. It's only about race. Right. That's I mean, what is you're we are so blind. I also I there was one thing I did want to mention about the racial disparity, actually. If, and I think that this is and I think some of these things we're trying to unpack so that you can have responses to people. But um, that racial disparity is a crack of shit thing. There's that woman. I don't know her name. She's a white lady. She's been around since like the 80s or 90s. And she does like talks about racial disparity to like kids in school and whatever. And there's this one video that's going around again where she's talking, speaking to a primarily white audience. And she said, oh, raise your hand if you would prefer if you would trade places with and prefer to be treated as a black person in America than the way you're treated now. And then she, nobody raises their hand. She's like, oh. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Maybe you didn't understand me. Let me maybe you didn't hear me. I don't know. Let me tell you, ask you again. And everybody think about this who's listening right now. Uh, raise your hand if you would prefer to be treated or if you'd be happy and totally OK with being treated the way black people are treated in America. And nobody raised their hand. And she's like, so that proves that, you know, that things aren't fair. We all know it's not fair. Even this guy saying it does, it's a crock of shit. I'd like to see, would you prefer to live your life as a black man in America where you know that you're having to run for your life from the police? So, I mean, I think that that's if you if you're if you're not raising your hand right now being like, yeah, we it's all e totally equal. I know that it's totally equal. So I'm very confident in doing a Freaky Friday twist off with like, with a trade off with a black person. Uh, if you know that that's not the case, then you know that racial disparity is a real thing. But the thing that I always hear the most about all of this is that um, it's part of history. And it's a part and it, it's proud, you know, so many people, especially in the South, are so proud of their heritage and their story, their grandparents story, the Civil War. I mean, you know, I have friends of my parents like, you know, actively go to Civil War reenactments and you know, like they're proud of this history of where we used to be. And, and that's what they're celebrating, where we were and ha where how far we've come. This is how far we've come, guys. It's not slavery. How, how long has it been over? 150 years. Civil rights movement was in the 60s. This is not where it there's there's so many things in place because of history that has to be undone for it to be equal that claiming that it's just part of my heritage and that I'm proud of where I came from and I'm proud of where we are now, that's, again, putting the blinders on and not accepting the truth of what history really is. And I go back to that because I think it's really important. And I think that that's where our voices need to be the loudest. Like even here in Nashville in the state capitol building, I think that there's been a lot of conversation about it, but there's a bust in the state capitol building of one of the founding uh, members of the KKK. He is, there is, they're celebrating him. And it it has been talked about removing it and putting Dolly Parton in his place. But there's so many, and why Dolly Parton? It's like right. these men, like, well, we need a woman in there. You know who we should have? Dolly Parton. It's random bless white her lady. Heart. That fucking yeah. random white lady. Yeah, there's so many different activists that you could, black activists, yeah. Nashville, you know, Jefferson Street, Nashville activists that you could be putting in there rather than having these these people celebrated for what they represented just because I, yeah. it's part of the heritage. It, it's back in so. that thing. It's like imagine having your rapist, having him celebrated every day in your town right in front of your face. I mean, it's like, again, and I'm only saying that because I'm afraid some some women are that's landing on deaf ears. There's all these like these excuses that l women love to make, these m men like to make. Like, well, oh, but it, you know, like exactly back to the history thing. It's like it's not cool. <laughs> it's just like not mm -hmm. okay. Um, I mean, ma make America great again. Everyone, people are saying that a lot. I mean, America, it's never been great. <laughs> I think that's what we're learning now. Right. But I There's, think that that statement, I think having our president be riding on that statement of make America great again, and we've talked about it, but like, what, what does that statement actually mean? I think there's so much, so, so many hidden messages in there. Again, it's that invisible, uh, you know, knapsack or what, or, you know, what exists in this country that we're choosing to ignore with that statement. And it's, it's, it's just unacceptable. 
Yeah. Also, there's some proof that I think that it's one of the mottos of the KKK mm. or white supremacy. Make America great again. So it's not that yeah. veiled even. <laughs> it's just like, right. oh, Actually, I'm going to use that. I'm going to use that saying that is totally. Um, yeah, it's really a bummer. I mean, that's an understatement, right? It's a bummer. <laughs> it's a bummer. That's a bummer. That's that really made me giggle a little bit. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> that's yeah, a bummer. So it's like my brain is starting to like to turn into mush. Um, I watched. This. <laughs> that's the title of this episode. That's a bummer. <laughs> that's it's a bummer. <laughs> it's a bummer. Oh God. Um, well, are we you know on our little we have a list here that we're working from because we wanted to make sure we we're being methodical about this and the it, we came up with this next thing is says why all the these riots and i think we've sort of talked about that and maybe there's more you want to say i do want to mention that i did get a chance to watch uh trevor noah did an episode of his show and talked about um all of this he's so articulate everybody should be watching him all the time he's so great but he i loved what he said he said you know if you think about and i've thought about this myself so i really appreciated the hearing it said better than the way I've been thinking about it and more completely. But he talked about society, right? And I, I was I've been thinking about it a lot in terms of the COVID stuff, because people a society is a group of people working together to have sort of peace and, you know, be Harmony. able to build a life together. Right. So if you're acting independently of that, you're not functioning properly in our society. So I was thinking about it in those terms previously but he's talking about it within the protests and black lives matter and all that and he was saying that if you basically society is a contract that we sign when we decide we're going to participate in society we all get a contract and the contract says uh if you buy into the society and you participate properly and follow the laws and do your civic duty and do all the things you're supposed to do then we'll protect you then we'll take care of you. We'll take care of your family. We'll make sure everybody's cool. So everybody born is born into the United States, unless you like move off into like a hermit woods or something. You are participating in the society. You're getting the benefits of society, right? You're 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 putting in your you know you go to work, you do your thing, you you participate, and then as a and then your side of the deal is that you get protected. What he's saying is that black people have been signing this contract every year over and over and over again and every year every time a black person is shot by a police officer who's unarmed you know an unarmed man is shot by a police officer or whatever murdered like we see their side of the contract is not being honored so imagine if you had a record deal right and the record deal said if you you know if you make this album we'll pay you this much money and then they don't pay you that much money then that contract is null and void by law, by definition. The contract is useless. So and, and in good faith, the black community has continued to re-sign that contract every day and still be like, well, maybe it'll be different today. Maybe it'll be different today. I'm still going to play by the rules, even though I'm not getting my end of the contract fulfilled. I'm not getting I'm not feeling protected. I'm not feeling like a full, full citizen in this society but i'm still trying to buy into the system because i i believe that there's got to be a, a better the contract's going to finally pay off at some point right at a certain point it's not the, your contract is not being fulfilled your end of the bargain is not being fulfilled why would they continue to sign that contract so when you see all these buildings burning and you're freaking out about the looting you're seeing it as a white person being like, why would they destroy their own community? Because your part of the contract has been fulfilled every time. Right. But in their case, that is their way of tearing up that contract and being like, y'all aren't doing anything for us. This isn't mine. That CarMax right. isn't mine. <laughs> Whatever. Right. That's I don't you know, I, what do I get out of that? And they've so, been screaming they've forever been for someone for to listen hundreds Forever. of years right this isn't a new problem no but nobody is listening and nobody's doing anything so of course buildings are going to be being you know burnt down because it's the only way to get people's attention yeah because nobody this colin kaepernick silently quietly you know kneeling they had problems with that yeah so we try that people have tried to do this peacefully and now, I mean, it's just like screaming into the abyss. Yeah. How frustrating. I mean, I can't even. How frustrating. Yeah. And we then, can't. We don't know because yeah. we're white and we have no idea what that feels like. Right. And I don't mean to, I didn't mean to skip over this one and I don't, 
I just think it's important to hit because it's very topical right now. But this idea that Karen is reverse racism, calling someone a Karen. It's like, get over yourself. Get the fuck over yourself. I'm sorry right. if your name is Karen. I, I know a lot of Karens that are probably like, it's fine. I get it. You know what I mean? Like, you got to get the fuck over yourself. We've been doing that shit, pulling that shit for years. In the oh. same way, in the same way that when we make a joke about men, and again, I'm I'm really only doing this. I'm very aware it's not the same thing. I'm trying to do it because I, I'm aware and I think for me it helped even when I, and I, again, not proud of this, but I think that when you can frame this from your perspective you can really understand at another level but so all y'all white ladies that are into white feminism out there um when we when you make a joke about men suck and then some dude comes on your page and goes well that's sexist that's sexist now see like you you blame us if we make a joke about you but you know it's sexist if you make a joke about us it's like no nah, dude you've been doing this shit the whole time Right. You give us a second to like have one thing to, to like to to throw back at you a little bit, you know? Right. It's not it's not a big deal. That Shaniqua thing that people th white people throw around to try to explain a certain kind of black woman, that's been done for a billion years. No, well, I mean for years. And that that that, that seemed to be and okay nobody with you. seems to. Right. Yeah, you're not upset about that. I do have to stop and say, Trevor Noah is the sexiest goddamn man alive. I don't want to objectify him too much, but I did watch that video too. And I know that he had really amazing things to say. And they and they were, I really took him to heart. But also, holy hell, this like quarantine look on him is real good. I just yeah. wanted to say that because uh, yum, yum. Yeah. <laughs> That's a little That's gross. beside the point. I'm sorry. I just, I, I, I think everyone should watch it because he's making very, very good points. But also, if you're hurting right now. Our horny video, which is also. Yeah, that's a whole other thing, too. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, so, but yeah. I mean, we're, we're, we're here for the people. Um, but uh, yes, very good points about why why these riots are happening. Yeah. Because and also, and the, and the Karen thing, I just want to say, like, if that's a thing that's been troubling you, really check yourself. That's what you're going to get upset about? Like, come on. Right. Right. Check your privilege out the door, please. Um, All right. Well, the very last thing that um, we can get to now is how can we white people, how can we use our, our white privilege to help in yes. these instances? Because, you know, like I said, this isn't about just making everybody feel bad about themselves and stuff. It's about having this information so we could do something with it. Right. Right. And there's a lot of work to be done. And I think that, yes. you know, <sighs> I've been noticing a lot of my white friends posting, you know, so many different things across the board of even just like starting with, you know, very, very simple things of how to talk to your children. And because we don't have kids, I don't know what that really looks like, but I do have nephews right now. And a good friend of mine who lives in L.A., she's a drama therapist. She started posting about how to talk to your children and what ways because a lot of a lot of people have been saying this, but it really can start at home and it can start with conversations with with young people. And and I would venture yeah. to say it has to start. Yes, at home. I think that that's a very good way to rephrase that. It has to start at home. So, I mean, I'm having conversations that I've never had with my parents right now, but I'm also having conversations with my sister about raising her children. And with Margot's case, you know, um, her husband is Indian and her twins, like one, one of the children uh, is white and one of the children is brown. And, and it's a real conversation to have is how are we going to teach about racism? And going back to my friend, Danielle, who's a drama therapist, she posted, there's all these amazing children's books that we can start with to start reading to these kids. And so I bought um, A is for Activists. It's a children's book and it it's beautifully done. And I immediately sent it to Margot to read to my nephews. And it's like a tiny, tiny, tiny little thing. And, you know, again, like to check, I got to check my white privilege. It makes me feel good. But it's like, it's these little things that are going to add up to bigger actions. And so that's like the smallest thing that we can start doing is having conversations at home. Yes. And I want to double down on that real hard in a real aggressive way. Sorry, not sorry. Uh, so if you have a biracial child, then yes, you're going to be forced to have a conversation at some point about race relations. I want you all that have white children to sit down with them and have a conversation 
about this. And it's not enough. I've seen so many liberal white mothers online recently in response to black women saying, white ladies, have a conversation with your white kids over and over and over and over. The response that I see from white mothers is, well, I yes, I, I talk to them. I teach them to love everyone. Oh. I teach them to love everyone and be good to everyone. No, 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 no. That is unacceptable. That is not enough. Yes, of course you should teach your children to love everyone. That is a given. That is a given. If you're not teaching your children that, you're a bad parent. You're a bad parent. I'm going to say that. This is not about loving everybody. This is about specific injustices against black bodies. Period. You have to, You. it is your duty as a white mother with white children specifically to sit them down and have an actual not just randomly be like love everybody have look them dead in the eye and say this country is not fair to everybody you have a privilege at this moment right now over your friend bobby at school because of the color of your skin i expect you as my child to function in the world as someone who is an active ally for Bobby and that community. I expect you to speak up if you see something, if it's safe, in a safe, and you know, if it's an under a safe situation. I expect you to see the world in this new way that we're talking about, that we, that we were not raised to see people. We were not raised to see it. It is this, your children can though. Mm -hmm. You have an opportunity to teach these children all this stuff we've been talking about right now, that will, this is how we stop this. This is how we make real change. I feel very strongly about the kid thing. And people get like, they say, well, I don't want my child to grow up too fast. I don't want them to have to, you know, I want, and I understand, but guess who doesn't have that luxury? Right. The amount of conversations that black families have to have with their black children at very young ages. And every single goddamn day. Over and over again too early too young they don't want they don't want their children to be exposed to the hate in this world either mm -hmm. but they don't have a choice so i'm not saying traumatize your child <laughs> like you can find ways to the book i think is is definitely a great conversation starter because i read that um children observe racism as early as two years old i'm sure they do and they under they're starting to understand race at that young of an age so that's why you got to have that conversation immediately. And and not only then and is lead it by one example. And lead, I was just going to say, it's not just then you have one conversation, then you like, you know, are racist. <laughs> like you you have to also then be working on yourself so that you can lead by example, because they're going to copy what you do. They're going to copy what you what they see. They're going to copy what they see on TV. You know, I mean, they're going to listen to our president, if you let him, you know what I mean? I think that it's really important that you you do that conversation. So I feel very passionately about that specifically. Right. Um, and also, it, it, when they're older, when your children grow up, then to have that conversation of what did you do during this time? This, this, is, this is a revolution that's happening right now. There's civil 100%. unrest in 2020. So yep. what are you going to tell your children? What are you going to tell your ch grandchildren? What did you do during this time? It's not enough to be an ally at this point. You have to be an accomplice. And that's what uh, Rachel was saying in her revolution speech last night that really hit you know, you can be a proud ally, but now, but how are you going to then be an active accomplice in, in, in taking action? And guess what? A really great way to take action is to talk to your kids. You know what I mean? You don't, if you're really not comfortable going out and protesting in the streets, cause it's fucking scary out there right now. So I understand that. Then don't do that. Then instead there's lists of things. And actually here's some more things that you can do, right? Um, you can call out friends and family, when you hear, you know, if you hear racist things being said around you, um, even just sm what you might consider small, you know, stereotypes, call that shit out. Call it out. Make people uncomfortable. Don't be afraid to make people uncomfortable. I say um, you can't say that anymore. We're not we're not doing yeah, that not, anymore. It's not OK. It's not yeah, OK. I like that. And then it leads to okay. a bigger conversation. It's not OK. We're, we're not. Doing and you have that. to have 
the guts to do it, right? Because you can let it slide. It's very easy to let it slide. We're saying don't do that anymore. Nope. No more. <laughs> um, I think another thing I think that people really need in their lives more is to just open their horizons. So number one, that's in reading different perspectives so that's one way to open your horizons i think also just like trying to socialize with different groups of people not just your regular old friends that you grew up with and all that and that could be joining a social justice group if you want to do that or it could be as easy as joining a gardening club in a neighborhood you're that's not your neighborhood <laughs> you know just mm -hmm. start, some new people have a new perspective right why why are we we are so insular Mm -hmm. And we're so like us versus them and all that. Mm -hmm. um, don't take over that group and then talk right. over people. You right. know what I mean? Don't do that. But, Go and listen. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And I saw there was somebody, this was very well said, and I can't, I'm very bad at citing my sources, but um, there was something about how we also, t as white, quote unquote, allies, trying to be allies, we'll lean really heavily on a relationship that we have with one or two black friends. And you almost like over, over talk about over, you know, push how like f good you are with those friends. Like, oh, those are my good, good, my good black friend. I have a black friend. We're very good friends, my black friend, <laughs> you know, and sort of overestimating that. So be careful about that shit, too. Um, but like open your horizons open. And that could even mean other white folks that you're meeting, not white supremacists, but other people, <laughs> you know. I and I also wanted to mention just on that sort of topic of being weird about your black friends you know what i mean <laughs> that's such a weird thing is and i'm seeing this a lot on the other side on you of you know posting is you're also you're not a white savior right this isn't we're not saying that it's our job it's our duty to save black people black people that's weird you know we're black people are they're black adults are not helpless babies mm -hmm. they just need help in numbers and they need people to be making political moves and like you had said earlier you know if a black if a white voice is being heard over a black voice then use your voice to give space for the black voice right you could literally just go hey he has something to say why don't we listen to bobby over here Jim jimmy you know that's a really good way to use your voice it's not about you being like i'm gonna swoop in and you said this earlier about how if it makes you feel good like be careful what your motivations are because it's not about you coming in like some superhero and trying to like save people it's, they don't need to be saved like that but also i think like when we're in and we've talked about this but when you're, when you're in certain situations as a white person if you're you find yourself in more of a black community of people just listen listen to what's happening step back and listen and take it in and then um and you know now's the time to really have these hard conversations with other white people as well but first we have to listen observe understand and then have then and then you know apply this to our daily lives type of thing yeah a co and then another thing you can do i mean so yes you have to be able to just be constantly having those conversations and being open to them other like smaller things you can do there's an, in that uh, google docs there's a whole this is really great, but it's um, sort of a step-by-step -step guide of how to start a white caucus. And a caucus is just a gathering of people. Um, so you can bring in some, reach out to some friends and say, hey, like, would you like to have a fun, we'll have, you know, have it over lunch. And they even recommend do it over a meal because that's like a good way to commune with people. And you can invite your white friends. You can invite anybody. I mean, it can be, a, you know, but the, but the subject is about white privilege and they really outline for you how you go through this comfortably and not comfortably because it's uncomfortable but sort of safely so that people can really start exploring that what what their belief system has been this whole time um and where it's a safe environment in that they're not getting like tramp you know if they say something that's like not okay then you can safely say, okay, so that was not okay. And like, let's unpack why, mm -hmm. as opposed to being like, you're a racist, you know, because right. that shuts people down. So it, it, I, you know, if you want to, especially out in middle America, if you want to gather a group of friends and try to start having conversations, that is great, you know? So, and I, I've been seeing a lot of people starting these book, book clubs and there's right. so many different books and on that document, there's lots of different books that we can use and, and, and read and, um, just, you know, to educate ourselves and, and then have these conversations. I think it's not only important 
for this type of action to um, read these books. But I think more importantly is to read them, process them, and have conversations with other white people about them. Yes. Because I agree with everybody that. has other stories and, and different experiences. And I think more than ever, we can learn from each other. Yeah. And we make mistakes. And unfortunately, we are in this weird cancel culture thing right now. So people are afraid to say what's on their mind. And sometimes you might say what's on your mind and it's hurtful. You know what I mean? And you may not know it's hurtful, but it's better to say it and get it out in a safe space and then have um, a conversation about it so you can then grow from it. You know, and I think that that's part of what this is about, too, is that giving each other space to acknowledge that we've been in a horrible broken system for a really long time and that it's okay to have missteps it's a, we're all gonna right. i mean i did see somebody post like we're, we're you're gonna fail at this at one point but also know that like you know you have to at least try yeah it's time yeah and you're trying is actually if you are trying in a real way your trying is gonna help you know if you're trying where you're like speaking over people or you're like, I'm trying, but I can't find any resources. That's not trying. <laughs> you know, there's there's a lot of resources for you. And we'll maybe post this particular Google Doc. I think that'd be a good idea. We'll post this Google Doc, a link to it somewhere when we post this podcast. So if you're wondering, where 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 do I start? Start there. Do we know start who there. wrote this Google Doc? Uh, put it together? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I'm sure it's somewhere. Yeah. I think it I think Grace. I did see somebody's name attributed to it and I'm not 100% sure. We can definitely cite them though in our post about yes. it. Great. So, I hope that you stayed with us for this. I hope that you've this has made you think about stuff. I would be very very open to if somebody's resistant to something and wants to send an email about like, but what about this? Please send it. Like, please let's talk. We can always talk more about it. This conversation isn't over, you mm -hmm. know. I mean, it's barely barely started. Right. Um so I have one thing I kind of wanted to read. Absolutely. That made me, because I, like, again, I could not sleep last night. I was so amped up. I was so angry and upset. And then also scared, just like scared for humanity, society, humanity. Yeah. Yes. And like, you know, you read negative, like these crazy responses from people and you're, you're scared because you're also like, how do you not see what's going on? You know, um, and the only thing that got me sort of semi asleep last night was an article from the star, which is this Toronto newspaper magazine. And they were talking about how, um, and this is the thing I love to preach, which is that all of this unrest and the COVID thing and the protests and all this, this is an opportunity to restructure America, you know, to do something to come out of this at the end of this in a better place. There's an opportunity there for that. And I loved this and I never, I did not know this. But um, this guy that wrote an article about he, this is a Republican guy that had written a book about how um, Trump is terrible. He's like a never Trumper. And he wrote a book about it. But in that book and talking about this Trump stuff and, and, and where we are right now and what Trump has done to us in terms of society. And it's not him. I mean, he's not the only, he's not the reason. It's, it's society is the reason. Um, but he points out that the word apocalypse doesn't actually mean the end of the world. The Greek word from the Bible originally and literally means an uncovering, a revelation, not the end, according to religious tradition, but a beginning, this new beginning, it would inaugurate a new and better order in which justice would triumph at last over injustice. We are going through an apocalypse right now, you know, and I, I love to throw that word around sort of in a joking matter, but it also partly because it, it scares me. But then to hear that what apocalypse means is a new beginning. AOC did a little uh, Instagram stream yesterday, and she kind of said the exact same thing. She didn't necessarily call it an apocalypse, but she did say it's like a restructuring of society. Everything has to kind of fall apart in order for us to rebuild. And we're at that place right now. Um, so I think that that's a positive way to look at it. And I think that we're... But nothing is going to change unless we step up. A hundred percent. But you know what can be a good motivator is hope. Mm -hmm. yes. And I think that that's where I do want to leave everybody is that we're in a really, it's crazy time right now. It's really horrifying. Um, but it is a time for action because there's hope at the end of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Well, I'm really glad that we did have this conversation. I was really nervous um, because, I mean, it obviously make racism, talking about race is uncomfortable um, because of the color of our skin. Yeah. And, and if somebody finds that we've made a misstep somewhere in this conversation, please call us out on it. Please let us know. You know, we want to, if we make a mistake, we want to learn from them too. So, yes. So shoot your emails over to us at difficultwomenpodcast at gmail.com. Also, if you uh, are feeling horny, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I don't we know have what a video out. Yeah, I know. Have a video out. Uh, you can listen to this quick little uh, snippet about how to take care of yourself in other ways. Yes, there you go. <laughs> free stuff is awesome, but free stuff to spice up your bedroom is even better. Select almost any one item for fifty percent off, and then Adam and Eve loads on the free stuff. Enter offer code Horio at checkout and get 10 tantalizing free gifts. A sexy item for him, a special gift for her, and a third item you'll both enjoy. And six free spicy movies. Ooh. Plus, free shipping. That's Horio. W-H-O-R-E-O. Horio at adamandeve.com. Well, thanks again for joining us. Um, also, this would be a really great podcast. If you enjoyed this and you feel like you got something out of it, this is the one to share with people. You know, um, if you want to have a conversation and you don't know how to start the conversation, send them our podcast. Right. Exactly. Just send them this. Be like, here, listen to this and then we'll talk. Right. Awesome. Well, well, thanks so much. Thank you all. Take care. Please stay safe. Yes.